All right, Nico, can you say welcome to another episode of Healthy Birds, Happy Babies? It's a happy episode. Um, happy babies. <laughs> Dad, I don't sound like that anymore. <laughs> I know, but you were only three years old when you did that, and you were cute, and people love it. Do you, do you want to try it again? Sure. Healthy babies. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's healthy births, happy babies. Happy births, healthy babies. Healthy births, happy babies. <laughs> happy births. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> Hello and welcome back to another episode of Healthy Births, Happy Babies. I'm Dr. Jay Warren, your host. I'm also a prenatal and pediatric chiropractor here in beautiful San Diego. I'm actually in North County, San Diego, if you know the area, in Encinitas. I practice at the CAP Wellness Center. And today's episode is going to be about developmental milestones. We've talked about that previously on a couple of episodes, but we're going to be talking about some changes that have been made recently at the time of this recording to the developmental milestone timings and whether or not it's appropriate and what some of the motivations were of that. My guest is Dr. Martin Rosen. He's quite the expert on this subject. He's actually been a mentor of mine for years. I've learned so much from him um, in working with babies and his cranial work. And he's here to help explain one, developmental milestones, what they are, why they're important, uh, the sequence of things. But then also we're going to dive into this subject of why just recently at the beginning of this year in 2022, uh, the milestone timing has changed. And uh, the reason why they did that isn't what you might think. So let me introduce you to Dr. Rosen, and then we'll jump right in. Dr. Rosen is a 1981 summa cum laude graduate of Life Chiropractic College, and since 1982, he's maintained a private practice in Wellesley, Massachusetts. Besides his practice, though, Dr. Rosen has traveled nationally and internationally teaching chiropractic technique, pediatrics, cranial adjusting, chiropractic philosophy, and practice management. He has Tons of educational offerings, including hands-on, as well as online workshops and seminars. And with his wife, Dr. Nancy Watson, they run Peak Potential Institute, offering premier educational programs for the chiropractic profession. Their most recent book, though, is for parents. It's called All in the Head, and it's written to inform and bring awareness of the implications that cranial distortions can have in the initial stages of childhood growth and development. And so with no further ado, let me switch over to my conversation with Dr. Rosen. Hello, Dr. Rosen. Welcome to the podcast. Thanks for joining me. Uh, Dr. Warren, thanks for having me. I really appreciate you taking the time and your podcast you do. We've heard some of them. It's an amazing work you do. So I'm really glad to be able to support you and um, to get my message across as well. Yeah, well, I'm glad to be able to have this conversation. Thank you for that. But um, the CDC has made some changes with developmental milestones. And I know as practitioners, we've been talking about the significance of that, whether it was warranted, what what that really means. And as far as the um, parents listening to this episode, they're going to have questions as well. So before we go into that topic, introduce yourself. How We read your bio, like we understand right. like uh, the breadth of what you're doing, but right. tell me what going back way back when, like how did you first get involved in or interested in working with babies? Okay. So I graduated chiropractic college in 1981. And one of my mentors was a man named Dr. Major Dijonet, who developed a technique called sacral occipital technique. And he talked even back in the, when I, in the sixties, he was thinking about the importance of pediatric chiropractic care, that how the foundation for the nervous system is laid down in the first two years of life. And that if there are issues with the foundation of the nervous system, they can create patterns or compensatory patterns that the child will live with for the rest of their life. It'll be almost like a genetic flaw or, or a birth type of trauma that if not checked or taken care of, will basically be carried and become the primary source of stimulus. So um, I also met my wife in chiropractic school. And when we graduated, um, we were seven and a half months pregnant. So we moved up to Massachusetts. I had gotten a job and we had this baby within you know two months of being here. And I realized that 
I had all the anatomy and physiology understanding, but I didn't have the technical skill set to deal with deal, checking this baby's nervous system. It wasn't taught in schools back then. And so I went to um, Dijonette and I was talked to him and we talked a little bit about how to develop a pediatric program. And so since I was one of the first people that approached him to get interested in it, he, we developed a pediatric program where he helped me and I used most of his basics in anatomy, physiology, and the nervous system and the duomeningeal system to help develop or modify his techniques to deal with the pediatric practice. So I basically, in essence, experimented on my firstborn, um, <laughs> learned it, you know, and then when I, you know, then what happened is my children, you know, we grew up, we moved to a new area. My children started getting involved with other children. We homeschooled for a while. So we had a homeschooling community and we had all these people who had kids who wanted alternatives to standard medical prototypes for their children. And they also understood they're very invested in their children's development, you know, especially people who are homeschooling at the time or people who were definitely very focused on being with their children, spending a lot of time with them. So they were intimately related to how their children's function. And they were looking for somebody who could help them not only monitor that, but help facilitate that. And I kind of became the go-to guy. And then it just developed, you know, after 40 years of practice, um, I think I had kind of have gotten it down a little bit now. Yes. And yes. you've uh, been a great instructor. You're teaching us chiropractors, myself included, right. to be able to do the work that you've been doing for years. And largely it's based on the, the pediatric population, as you said, and right. kids and birth trauma, unwinding that tension, exactly. and allowing their spine and nervous system to grow and develop without interference. And so right. that plays directly into the developmental milestones and making sure the nervous system is developing perfectly. Will you explain to the parents listening first what the major milestones are that they're talking about? If you're a first time right. parent, you might not really know what to look for. And then we'll talk about like significance of them and what these changes meant. So what are, what are the major milestones? So that developmental milestones are number one, you may be able to pick up their head. So when they're lying on the belly, pick up the head. Then the next developmental milestone is for them to turn over. So I decide. Then the next develop milestone will be for them to be able to sit up and then to creep, first creeping like an army crawl and then crawling on all fours, cross crawling, and then walking. Um, those are the, the one level, the motor developmental milestones. There are also emotional developmental milestones, and there's also language developmental milestones. At certain points, your child should be able to speak, you know, two word couplets, be saying something besides mom and dad, put, start to put sentences together. Most of that process prior to the CDC, the lay of the foundation was within the first 18 months. That was the cutoff time. That was the benchmark when you wanted to certain, certain milestones, because what we found is that if these milestones weren't reached in those first 18 months, the child would have a much diff more difficult time in their functional development as time went on. And as they got older, like age three or four, they might have problems with processing information or even behavior emotional issues, because if they don't create the milestones, that creates an intimacy and an integrity in the nervous system. And so it becomes a coordinated system. So when they get older, around age three or four, and they have to basically call on upper level brain functions, you know, and interact with their environment and actually take in more information. If they don't have a basic milestones that have been developed over the time, they may have trouble integrating really uh, other information and communicating. So that's why they're so important. Okay. And a lot of parents get worried about their, if they've heard about these milestones, like they didn't hit sure. them on time, right? That uh, the typical thing is like picking up their head by three months, sitting right, up right. six months, but the walking right is the major one of like, oh my gosh, Johnny's not walking out of their first birthday. They're behind. Right. What kind of range in those develop and those milestones yeah. should a parent expect to be? So as, as I said, we're looking, there's a, in, in our world, you know, the chiropractic neurological world, 18 months is a cutoff point for all. So, so they say a kid can start walking average 11 to 17 months. Okay. Holding their head up, usually one to three months sitting, maybe four to seven months, crawling seven to 10 months. So there are like three or four month windows, which doesn't sound like a lot as an adult, but it's huge when you're talking about neurological development. 
you know, you're talking about, I mean, just to give you an idea. So when your brain makes connections, what we call synapses, when it makes neurological connections and creates pathways, like the roadways for your brain to give information to the rest of your body, the highest, the fastest time, the greatest growth of that synaptic development is at eight months of age. So that's why it's so important. So where legs, like if you were building a city, and you only had eight months to lay the roadways that all these people are going to drive on for the rest of their life, it would be a very important time. And that's what's happening. Now, of course, we curate synapses the rest of our life, but I'm talking about the highest propensity. So if you have a child that's 14 months old, hit most of their milestones and is not walking cross patterning yet, that's still not a problem. It starts to get to be a problem when they're 18 months, 19 months, then it becomes a problem. I mean, one of the older kids that we had come in, that was a problem that had no speech and could not walk was 23 months of age. But what's great about that is under proper chiropractic care and development, they can start to reprocess those milestones. For example, this little boy, by the time, so he was 23 months of age, he didn't talk, he didn't walk. Within the first six weeks, he started saying words. And by the second month of care, he was walking. So it's not a lost cause as long as you know where to look for those milestones and where to get help for that. And in that analogy of laying down road work, like if it wasn't done in the first eight months, the concept and the premise of neuroplasticity is what parents will start learning about. It's like, it's not too late. No, it's not. No, no. The eight months is just, I'm, I'm just using that as a benchmark to show you how fast the process is going. You yeah. create new neurons and new pathways your entire life. If you and I didn't do that, we wouldn't be able to learn anything. Right. I'm just talking about this simply. So if you think about learning a language, think learning a language. If you learn a language, if you live in a house that has is bilingual and you're brought up with two languages and you get those two languages and they integrate into your nervous system, it's much easier to ever speak those two languages fluently than if, let's say, you or I decided to learn a different language at this point in our lives, you know, or, or 30 years old. So it's much harder because the integration is harder. Their pathways don't form quite as fast. But as we know, people can relearn things. You can you can lose a, your right arm and end up learning to be left handed. You know, so the body we are fault tolerant individuals, which means basically we can compensate for these losses. The thing that we want to be careful of is to not lay down these compensatory patterns so that a child is in a compensatory state all the time. We're mm-hmm. looking for optimum function as opposed to compensatory function. Right. And those compensatory functions are harder for the nervous system to right. work through. So it's just an energy expenditure that we exactly. don't want to have them drained from. Right. And it can lower a threshold. That's the other thing that it can do. It can lower the threshold to be able to adapt to other situations. So you want to be really careful about that. You know, as we get older, we need we need more and more of our nervous system to integrate. And therefore, if we have a bigger threshold, then we can adapt to our environment. So not only learning, but just the environment itself, being able to, you know, to, to speak, to interact with people, to deal with stresses, you know, even something as simple as allergies, right? You know, allergies are just the body's inability to deal with certain specific proteins. It's like, you know, for you or I, peanuts are not deadly, but for the guy sitting next to us, peanuts can be deadly. Why is that? It's because his nervous system threshold is reached much faster because of compensatory patterns. Well, the same thing happens with learning or, or language or behavioral patterns. All of those are based on your thresholds and your capacity to adapt to stresses because life's stressful. Right. And so in an emotional sense that being close to threshold or lower um, threshold is those like volatile kids that just can't handle, they don't have enough bandwidth to handle everything that's going on, meltdowns and the like. So there may be something going on in a, in a nervous system threshold sense that those children can be helped. Yeah. Well, a perfect example. So let's talk about, I mean, if you name two things, sensory integrative disorder, let's say proprioceptive and sensory proprioceptive disorder. Basically what we're saying is kids get an environment and they can't deal with the environment. There's too much input. They can't process it. It can't fit through their brain because they haven't integrated the nervous system. Some kids, when that happens, they'll shut down. They'll, they'll back off. They'll, they'll move away from the side. They'll completely close them. So other kids will act out violently. They'll hit, they'll swing. And so it's the same stimulus. It's just how their nervous system is adapting to it. Mm. A perfect example of that that I use, and I like to use in my lectures is, so I grew up in New York City. 
I also drove a taxi cab for a short period of time to make some money when I go to New York. My wife drove, grew up in Concord, New Hampshire, a small town in New Hampshire. So we both learned to drive in those. That's, those were the primary years where we learned to drive. You know, I lived there and that's why I got my driver's license to drive. If we are going someplace in traffic, all right, and there gets to be a lot of traffic, if I'm driving, I react much differently to the traffic pattern that she does. I will tend to be aggressive, swerve in and out of lanes, try and get there. She will like chill. <laughs> so again, same stimulus, yeah, different learned pattern behavior, but it just depends on how our thresholds are also how we adapt to that situation. So she has a bigger threshold for that. She'll react differently to that. And it's because of the way her nervous system developed during that primary time where she learned that skill set. And Got so it. the same thing happens with kids. Right. And as far as those, um, those milestones, are they absolutely sequential? Like one always builds on another? Is there yeah. overlap? So the milestones, there's a pace, place in your brainstem. So your brainstem is right in the back of your head at the base of your skull. There's a cerebellum and then there's a brainstem and then it goes into the spinal cord. In that area of your brain is an area that has what's called pre-programmed proprioceptive feedback loops. It's a big name, but what it means is those are pre-programmed to fire off at certain times. Like it wouldn't make sense if your kid couldn't sit up that they'd be able to stand and walk. Right. So it's developed neurologically, but it's also developed physiologically and, and structurally. So if you can't, so when you hold your head up, when you're born, you have one primary curve. In other words, when you're in utero, you're bent over, right? You're a big C curve. And then what happens is as you start to hold your head up, you form the first primary curve, which is in the neck. And then when you start to sit, you start to form the second primary curve in the low back. And those curves allow your spine to actually function under gravitational stresses. So if you don't have those curves, you can't stand up because otherwise you'd have a big C curve, which means your head will be tucked down in front of your knees. And when you stood up, you stand up like a C. So not only are they pre-programmed neurologically, they have to work biomechanically as well. You have to develop the musculature. You have to develop the spinal structure at the same time so that you can follow through these milestones. Um, talk a little bit then about those precocious walkers as they're talked, or they skip crawling. We know they how skip, yeah. we've talked a lot on this podcast about how important like the cross crawl and crawling right. is, but how does that work that a kid will skip that right. milestone? So once they have the biomechanical pattern and once they have the structural underlying process, the nervous system can sometimes skip an integration part. So crawling is integrating right and left brain. So for example, sometimes you'll see kids are not what we call lateralized. In other words, they don't function from a dominant hemisphere. Um, it's not just like ambidextrous, but sometimes kids won't be coordinated or they'll be dyslexic or they'll have trouble performing certain functions as they get older. The reason is because their nervous system hasn't integrated as well. So cross patterning or cross crawling or what that does to develop, it helps the brain communicate. So the first, up till age 10, your brain is still communicating through this area in the midbrain. It talks to each other and that is developing for the first 10 years of life. So the better that develops, the better your right and left brain can talk and coordinate with each other. If you skip creeping and crawling, that decreases, it doesn't shut it down, but it decreases those intercommunication nerves, what they call it. So again, it's about that. So it decreases them. So it decreases the level that your right and left brain can talk to itself. And that can be a myriad of issues, or it may not even look like anything, or it may be a kid um, who is very, let's say, spatially oriented. So for example, I had a family once, I had three kids, Two of the kids were extremely coordinated. They were very, you know, they were very athletic. They skied. And the third one wasn't. And the mother was really concerned about it. And she's like, oh, you know, she can't, you know, she doesn't. Every time we go skiing, she falls. Every time she plays soccer, she trips and hurts herself. And when we went through the evaluation, we found out in this case that that child that, that was one of the children was the child that actually never crawled. She actually skipped that phase. Now she was a bright kid. Um, I, you know, now she's in college. Actually, she's a very bright kid, but she was definitely different than her brother and sister. She didn't have the physiological integration. She was still very smart. She still did very well in life, and so that was probably part of that glitch that she didn't have the ability to cross pattern. And I, in my own particular experience, my second child, who was very athletic, went through the milestones very fast, and when she was about eight eight and a half, she was actually starting to walk. And by the time she was nine, she was walking across pattern. Now she went through all the milestones extremely fast. 
She ended up being an amazing athlete. She was a gymnast and it just became natural to her because that's how her nervous system developed. Um, but she went through the milestones. So it's important. I feel that it's very important to go through all the milestones because again, it integrates your nervous system better. If you miss a milestone, which the one that people most miss is creeping and crawling. That's the one that tends to be skipped. Um, my experience is in practice that kids who tend to miss that milestone tend to have other issues as well. I have a, a great example. I had this little girl brought to me. She was 18 months. Um, she wasn't sleeping. She had digestive issues. She was acting out all the time. She was, you know, you know her parents were like at their wits end. She slept like two hours a night tops. Um, and so she came in and I started adjusting her and she started getting better. And then her mom said to me, she said, the freakiest thing happened. I said, what? She said, well, Bella, went downstairs to play. She had an older brother with her older brother. And now Bella skipped creeping and crawling. She said, she never, she goes, she started creeping and crawling around the basement with her brother. And so, so she started, she actually reintegrated her nervous system at 18 months, started creeping and crawling, went backwards. And, and, you know, now she's, she's 13. Yeah. She's 13 years old and she's absolutely fine. You know, she's she but she actually, without us putting it on her, without her, you know, training it, she actually retrained her nervous system innately, which is something that can happen as well. Cause I've, I've heard of programs that help uh, older yeah. kids, like five, right. six, so school age yeah. kids go back and do that. But innately her nervous system yeah, went back it. and got, she wasn't told or the parents weren't told to do that. We had no, no, they had no, they just went downstairs and she was playing with her older brother and then she was That's crawling. And they, mom said she did it for about six weeks instead of getting up and walking over to him or playing with the blocks. She just crawled over, you know, she creeped. That's crawled beautiful. Over. Yeah, it's amazing. amazing. It's amazing. But you're right. There are a lot of programs that do that, even with adults who have been injured, like if they have a brain injury. There are programs that you can do to help rebuild the brain. And most of them involve some kind of cross patterning, mm -hmm. whether it be creeping and crawling, cross walling, or even swimming, doing the crawl. That's a cross patterning exercise. So yeah. to reiterate something you said too, it's not, it's, if a, if a kid goes through those milestones quickly, that's not a concern. It's just more it's of the sequence. Yeah. Okay. It's about, right. It's about, everybody does everything. That's why they give you a time frame. You know, I remember this little boy who his parents are freaking out because he was 14 months old and he wasn't walking. And I said to the parents, very honestly, he's doing his other milestones. He's great. I said, Michael has a huge head and he's literally having trouble balancing on his spine. And, he didn't actually walk till he was 16 months. So his body caught up to literally the size of his head. And so, you know, that was, for me, it was a very mechanical thing. I could see that the kid was neurologically sound. He was doing fine. He just had a hard time literally holding his head up till yeah. he was like 16 months. I yeah. worked with a baby of the same thing. He had, he had a gigantic head and it just, right. all of those milestones are just a little slower than his older right. sister because right. biomechanically, he just had a lot more work that those muscles and the right. nervous system had to, had to integrate. You, you made a really good point also. And I think you just did it, you know, subconsciously is like, don't compare your child to the guy next to the child next door. Right. Oh, Johnny, it doesn't mean you're smarter. If you walked at nine months than if you walked at 13 months, None of that is the case. The case is that the, the nervous system has to integrate and it does at its own speed based on your particular parameters. And also very often the second child in a family will hit the milestones faster than the older one, often because they have somebody to mimic. Right. They want to keep up with their brothers and stuff. Exactly. But not always the case, but so often that's the case as well. Right. And so let's talk then about these changes that have come about just in these last couple of months at the time that we're recording that and like why that's significant one for us as practitioners, but then even more importantly for our listeners, like sure. what, what prompted these changes and what are so, the changes? Right. So I am not um, privy to all the CDC's decisions, but my experience is what prompted it is, is that we're having a much a plethora of kids who are neurologically challenged for a lot of different reasons. Um, COVID was a really big thing. Kids were shut down. Um, they wore masks. They didn't get to, in, to interact. I've seen three months old who've come into my office during COVID. The mom said, this is the first time they've been out. This is, you know, you're the first adult they've seen between their mother and father. They have, you know, so there's all that stimulus is what grows the nervous system. So you have to have stimulus. So that is, I think part of it is we're starting to see lower function and the CDC trying to choose something that is becoming more common as a normal. And that's what I find really dangerous. 
So for example, when I went to chiropractic school and graduated, the autism rate was one in 2,500. Now it's somewhere between one in 38 and one in 42, depending on what you read. So now people are okay with autism. Like it's, it's, it becomes a normal instead of, and it's just because it's common. The other thing is that we talk about is we talk about cranial facial distortions. Probably you've been in practice a long time. We notice that at different points in time, people tend to kind of gravitate to a chiropractic for specific symptomatology. Like for some reason, they hear, oh, chiropractors can help with ear infections. Oh, chiropractors can help with asthma. Now, what a big thing is happening, the two things are tongue tie, they're very common, and things like plagiocephaly or brachiocephaly, flathead syndrome. So one of the things that we're seeing is that's happening more often. Matter of fact, the American Pediatric Association said that 47% of the kids being born now have cranial distortions, cranial facial distortions, 47%, all right? And so what we've done and what the CDC has done is we've seen this happening and instead of going, wow, why is this happening? they just make it normal. I, I was talking to a friend of mine, I said, you know, we're making abnormal normal now. I said, if we watch the Olympics and every year the runners got slower and the high jumpers jump lower and the swimmers swam, so would we be happy with that? Like, oh, they're getting less, the world records are lowering. So what I feel like the CDC has lowered the threshold to adapt instead of finding out why this is happening, why the neurological degradation of our kids is happening. Instead of that, they made it an easy way to adapt. So parents won't be upset. And the other thing is I can't guarantee this, but I know that a lot of people have problems getting early intervention subsidies um, in different towns. So if you move the thresholds out and your kid is then evaluated by an early intervention specialist, and you're now, instead of something that should have happened at 12 months, now it doesn't happen to 17, 18 months, they can say, oh, your kid's fine. We don't need to do early intervention. So that will save a lot of money. Um, but actually, you know, the people in my practice who were really upset about that were speech therapists and pediatric nurses were two of the, of the demographics who came and said, I can't believe they did this. This is horrendous, especially the speech therapists because they lowered the speech level. So that is my um, take on it is instead of trying to figure out why this is happening, let's just make it abnormal. And even the American Pediatric Association, when you talk about head shape, they say 47% of kids have head distortion, but we only need to treat 10% of them. That's, yeah, exactly. Why? That's their numbers. Yeah, yeah. why did pick 10%? Only 10% are bad enough to treat. And, um, you know, you and I are chiropractors, right? If someone comes in with a, a curvature of the spine, a scoliosis, and we see half our practice have a scoliosis, we go, ah, we're only going to pick 10% and treat. The less of them can just like continue to deteriorate. Right. So, yeah, so I think there is you know, that's the process in it. Chiropractors are always looking at potential. We're always looking at function and structure, how they interrelate. We're always looking to what that external structure affects the underlying nervous system, because that's really what we're about. We're about the nervous system. We're not about the bones and muscles. So we want to know how the structure is affecting function. And I think that the CDC has just taken function and lowered the bar, basically. Right. Well, it's, I want to come back to that in a second, but one thing you just mentioned is I see so many more kids in those last few years than I have like in the past couple of decades for head flat, um, flat yeah. head syndrome, those kind oh, yeah. of things. And most of the time parents are bringing them in because of simply a cosmetic issue, right. which isn't insignificant. I'm not saying it is, yeah. but the conversation then around like, the cranium is where right. your brain sits. It's, it exactly. houses your brain. It's much right. more than just having to wear hats. It's, right. more, it's about function. Talk more about that because I think that's right. so important for parents to hear. So to try and simplify it, 80% of your central nervous system is your brain. That's right. 80% of the nervous. So if you think of the brain, it's wrapped in this tissue called the dura. Okay. And it's like a, it's a, it's a slightly flexible connective tissue that attaches to the inside of the cranium, attaches around the brain, goes down the spinal cord and goes all the way and attaches to the tailbone. It's two main functions is to maintain tension on the nerves because it also attaches to every single nerve as it exits the spinal cord. And so it's two functions to maintain proper tension in the nervous system. And the second function is to allow the movement of cerebral spinal fluid. So cerebral spinal fluid is basically the lifeblood of the central nervous system. It's like, it's the lymphatic system. It also supplies nutrients. It also uh, modifies temperature changes in the brain. So it is the lifeblood. So that's what that dermal meningeal system is. And again, remember it attaches to the cranium. So if you think of it, 
if you think of a cranium that's really distorted, what you're going to find is that the dural attachments inside the cranium are being stressed. So think about if you're in a tent, and right? if you have a tent with a tent pole in the middle and the tent on either side, if I pull on one side of that tent, I'm going to shift the tent pole and I'm also going to change the tension. Well, think of that tent pole is part of your spine and think of in on top of that tent pole is your brain. And when I shift the tension in that, in that, on that tent, I change the tension on the brain. And one of the things um, a man named Alf Brigg, who wrote a book called Adverse Mechanical Tension, in the Central Nervous System says that one of the worst things that causes the nervous system to not function or nerves to not function is increased traction. So basically increased tension. So when you're looking at a distorted cranium or a distorted face or even a distorted spine, if there is tension in the dural meningeal system, which is what drives the growth patterns in the pediatric practice, that changes the tension on the nerves. And when you change the tension on the nerve, you change the way that nerve fires. If you change the tension on the brain, you also change not only how the brain synapses, but you also change how it gets nutrients because that dural meningeal system is a fluid filled system. And if you squeeze a fluid filled system and you squeeze some of the fluid out, that area doesn't get proper fluid or proper nutrition and can't get rid of toxins. So it becomes a very global effect. Right. And most of the kids that I'm seeing that have um, either on one side of um, flattened head or in the, in the back, or even like, you know, kind of egg shaped oh, right. coming in from the bed, right. they're having breastfeeding issues. It interferes yeah. with the suck, yeah. swallow, breathe, much more irritable and fussy, harder Absolutely. to calm, digestive issues, gassy, constipated. Yeah. And that link, sometimes I see a kid like at three or four months, they were referred into me and then going back in the history of, right. oh, breastfeeding was a big challenge. We ha- we weren't able, we weren't successful. The All these kind of things are linked. So hearing right. this for the first time before the baby's born, hopefully inspires these parents to get these things checked yeah. sooner rather than later. Well, you got to understand also. So when you're talking about the cranium being distorted outside, also what drives the way the cranium moves and what drives it also is the palate inside the mouth. And so when the cranium outside is distorted, very often, if you would take your finger and put it inside and feel the baby's mouth, you'll feel the palate uneven or it'll feel really compressed or really high and narrow. And that, just like you said, affects nursing. If the palate's too high and narrow, when the baby tries to suck on the mom's breast, they can't flatten the nipple against the top of that of the roof of the mouth. And so they start to suck in air and they get colic or they can't feed or they'll pull off. Um, so you're right, the whole distortion pattern. I mean, the cranium, so the whole job of the cranium in the infancy for the first two years of life is not really to protect the brain, but to allow it to grow. In the first year of life, your baby's brain will grow 101%. And the next year, another 15%. So the first two years of life, you're laying down 80 to 90%, like you said, of the the nervous system. And also the brain is growing to two and a half to three times its actual size. So the cranium is allowing the brain to expand. If you have a flat spot on one part, that's actually the perfect example of why you get phlegiocephaly. If I have a flat spot in the back of my head, My brain's going to continue to grow because it's life-sustaining. So what it's going to do is it's going to, if it can't grow in the back because there's too much tension back there, or there's a fixation, or there's some kind of distortion or problem, then it's going to grow to the front. And that's going to create a bulging in the front. So you have a flat spot on one side, a bulging on the other. And that is basically classic flagiocephaly. Um, And a, a lot of times brachycephaly, how they grade it, which is called flathead syndrome, they grade it by not only how flat the back of the head is, but how wide the back of the head expands because same situation. If the head can't expand backwards, it's going to expand laterally because the brain is going to grow. And again, even though, again, what we talked about is being fault tolerant, we compensate. You're now looking at a a compensated cranium, which is a compensated brain and developmental protocol for the brain. Right. And it's all those I mean, that's not a little thing, but it's all the little things that your body's having to use a little bit more energy to do this, a little bit more for this, a little bit for this, that lessens that threshold that makes those kids just not be able to handle as much. And we, as parents want to give them every, everything we can allow them to flex and adapt to all the stressors that this life shows to them to, so it doesn't break them down. And I think this is a key for them. Well, think about this. There's a certain amount of energy that your body needs to have to maintain its what we call homeostasis, maintain its balance, maintain its growth patterns. And so let's say your body needs 25% of that, of, of your general energy just to do that. For example, the, you know, the brain takes 20% of the body's oxygen, 25% of its glucose or sugar. That it takes if that's what it needs to survive. 
So let's say that you now create a distortion pattern, a compensation pattern, kind of what you just said, that now to survive because the body is demanding more, is more compensated. Now you need 40% of the body's energy to just survive, just to maintain homeostasis. So exactly what you said, now there's less available for growth, for aqua potential, and for healing. That's also why you'll see kids very often who are maybe, you know, in the beginning of life, they, oh, they have some feeding issues, they have some colic issues, then they develop eczema, then they develop asthma. And as you track them, their symptoms shift, but tend to get worse because what's happening is the body continues to break down because the threshold's lower. So you need a certain amount of energy to survive and you want to keep that amount of energy as low as possible. So there's much more energy available for to thrive, basically. Right. All right. And so all, like you just said, all these compensations chop away at those that threshold and make it more energy you need just to walk down the street. Right. You know? Right. Well, Dr. Rosen, in our last couple minutes here, let's kind of go through, summarize um, like kind of some major points that you want the parents listening to get from this conversation. And not necessarily they need to know every single milestone and the like, right. but what's the take home message that you'd like these parents to, to get? Okay. So I would say the number one take home message in my experience and practice is moms listen to your intuition. If you think that there's something wrong, then go get it checked out because it's my experience that moms will know way before any diagnostic protocols can be um, can be found. The other thing is, just like you have your baby checked by the pediatrician, they measure the feet and the legs and the weight, you should have your baby checked by somebody who is a specialist in pediatric chiropractic care because we're going to evaluate the nervous system and help you walk through this process. Okay. So, you know, if you see a common process that is occurring and that it feels, especially if you have the kids, feels like it's not really normal, then trust your instinct because just because it happens to Judy and Sally and, you know, Kate's kid doesn't make it normal. It just means it's common. And therefore you want to be able to have somebody and some way to check that, especially it's so important to get your baby checked within that first year of life because that's when we're laying down so much foundation. So that's, I guess, that would be my take home. Trust your intuition. You see something, and, you know, it's kind of that, what, what's the saying now? If you see something, say something. Well, right. now if you see something, do something. Right. Beautiful. Well, and uh, how can uh, parents like find out more about the work you do? Or if you're a practitioner listening to this, where can they learn more about you? Sure. So my wife and I, Dr. Nancy Watson, just wrote a book called It's All in the Head. And it is basically talks about milestones, primal reflexes, anatomy and physiology, as well as cranial and facial distortion patterns. And you can get it by it's going on a website. It's all in the head book.com. You can get that book there. It's also on Amazon. If you want to get Bezos some more money, um, you can get it from Amazon. If you're a practitioner and you want to learn more about what we do in our techniques, then you can go on to peakpotentialprogram.com and that will give you all of our courses, both our online and hands-on courses. And also parents, if you want just general information, my office is Wellesley, W-E-L-L-E-S-L-E-Y, Cairo.com. And we have a bunch of information about pediatrics. And the last piece, I have another website called Dr. Martin Rose and DR martinrosen.com. And that is also has a, some of our courses listed. It also has a listing of all our certified practitioners. People have taken our courses and gone through the open. So if you live in a, you know, someplace else and they're from all over the world, if you live someplace and are looking for a practitioner that can help you, that can do this work. If you go on that website and go to our graduates, it'll have a whole, whole list of certifications. So any one of those avenues, and of course, email us, email me at drmartinrosen at gmail.com. And we'll, you know, connect with you if you need to. Fantastic. I, I'll make sure all four of those websites are awesome. in the show notes. So you can just click onto them and go directly to it. Well, Dr. Great. Rosen, thank you again so much for being here. I'm um, sharing your wisdom. I've learned so much from you in my career. So I want to thank you for that, but then also thank you for coming and uh, educating the, um, our listeners. Again, thanks a lot, Dr. Warren. It's really been a pleasure and I truly appreciate all you do and for having me on and allowing me to share this with other listeners. 
don't forget, I have two free offers for both moms and dads. First, for the moms, I have my 40 ways of connecting with your baby during pregnancy that you can get on my website at drjwarren.com slash 40 ways. That's four zero ways. And for the dads, I have the nine myths about becoming a dad that is also available on my site at drjwarren.com slash nine myths. That's the number nine myths. So both moms and dads are covered. Go check them out. I hope you enjoy them. 